have realized that the title is Oh Brother Man, Fold to Thy Heart, and not Fields to Thy Heart, as I said. And it's so appropriate. Everything that has taken place so far leads us to this moment that we've been waiting for and the highlight of our service. As my beloved co-presenter in classes, Reverend Anne Shand comes forward to just warm our hearts and to inspire us. We just need to give her that warm welcome, knowing that as always, she comes with something really special. Reverend Anne Shand, please come forward. Thank you, thank you, Reverend Sonia, for setting the stage for me. And welcome, welcome to all joining us in our beautiful center, Temple of Light, Kingston, Jamaica. Yes, church family, welcome. And all those in cyberspace, as well as those are in the sanctuary. While well, we are enjoying a warm morning and all the beautiful flowers and colors. And indeed, there's somebody in the sanctuary who is, I call my mom. <laughs> Miss, <laughs> Mrs. Kidu is here with me today. Yes, she, she held me in her arms as a baby. <laughs> yes, man, she knows who I am. Little bit? I know, this tall. <laughs> oh, the last time I had the privilege of sharing my thoughts on the theme of spiritual awareness, I left a suggestion with you which went like this. Let us be increasingly aware of our relationship with God living spirit almighty by the seasoning of our thoughts words and actions with an attribute of our god nature or the combination of all that of life love light power peace beauty and joy until we embody them in such a way our entire belief system radiates their qualities and or their characteristics. The word seasoning is a noun from the verb to season, which by the Oxford Dictionary gives the application to add salt, herbs, spices to improve the flavor of food. But this morning, I'm sharing my thoughts on salt. My theme is a pinch of salt. In Matthew, one of the Gospels of the Judeo Christian Bible, Jesus the Christ, Master Teacher, in chapter 5, verse 13, stated, and I quote, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. Of man, end of quote. To put it all in context, let us talk a little bit about the history of salt. Salt is a natural compound composing of the elements sodium and chloride, and it can be found on the floor of dead, dried up seas or living ones, or it can bubble to the surface of the earth from caverns, or it can be found in white shafts or veins thousands of feet deep in the earth. Once it was discovered that it could preserve food, especially meat, and used as a condiment, as well as to cure leather, it became an important commodity in the history of mankind. Its economic importance enhanced its value. It became known as white gold. Scarcity kept it precious, and as civilization spread, it became one of the world's principal trading commodities. In the sixth century, one salt ounce was traded for an ounce of gold. In Ethiopia, old name Abyssinia, slabs of rock salt was in fact the coin of the realm. 
Besides being served for flavor, preserve food, cure leather, it was a good antiseptic, which is why the Roman word for these crystals, sal, is a first cousin to Salus, the goddess of health. In those days, one of the busiest roads in Rome was called Via Salaria. The salt route over which the Roman soldiers marched and merchants drove carts full of the precious crystal from the salt pans of Ostia. A soldier's pay was partly in salt and became known as solarum argentum, from which the word salary was derived from. In fact, a soldier's salary was cut if he was not worth his salt. <laughs> As a preservative, salt became a token of permanence to the Jews in the Old Testament. Its use in Hebrew sacrifice as a meat purifier came to signify the covenant between God and Israel. From a Roman religious ritual to the Roman Catholic baptismal ceremony, a pinch of salt was placed in the mouth of a child for symbolic purification. In the catechism, salt was considered a metaphor for the grace and wisdom of Christ. So when Jesus the Christ used the term, ye are salt of the earth, he was addressing the blessed among the multitudes who was listening to the Sermon on the Mount. Additionally, from a biological sense, salt facilitates the opening of the taste buds to the flavor of what is placed in the month, the mouth. So it allows the savoring of the different flavors of herbs and spices combined together for seasoning. Savoring here means the appreciation of the combination of herbs and spices used. So metaphysically, as we learn to utilize the tools taught in the science of mind or teaching, the science of mind and spirit, to deepen our awareness of the presence of spirit within us, within us as well as well as in that relationship, oneness, oneness with spirit, spirit in which, in we, which are we are immersed in, in it, we, in it we, we live more and have our being. Once we, once we develop spiritually along this pathway, our growth and evolution into that which we are created to express our purpose radiates in every aspect of our being. We now become the seasoning in our world of affairs and by extension, the entire cosmos. So when Jesus the way shower challenges us not to lose our savor, the ability to truly appreciate glory, rejoice in our divinity, celebrate our Christhood, it was a serious challenge. If we forget who we are, that savor that is a part of us, we become good for nothing except to be cast out and to be trodden on the foot of men. In those Roman days, when the salt was contaminated, lost its flavor, it was thrown on the temple floor to prevent slipping in poor weather conditions. So you understand what Jesus meant when he said not to lose your savor. Eric Butterworth, new thought luminary in his book, Discover the Power in Me, suggested that the value of salt, salt was in its addition to seasoning or nourishing food for the wetting, wetting of the appetite. Metaphysically meant that as students of truth, we must accept the responsibility of becoming a seasoning influence in the world by becoming the spiritual level of truth. Our presence must add flavor, allowing the appreciation of our divinity to be mirrored in all who we come into contact with." End of quote. In truth, we live and share, if nothing else, but to consider that the omnipotence, the omnipresence, omniscience, and omniactivity of God and our relation to it, that we were created from that presence in its image and likeness, expressing its nature and attributes. 
So how do we behave then as a spiritual leaven or a pinch of salt, which is to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate anyone who comes into contact with us anytime, night, night, or day, or day. To assist me, I'm going to I'm going utilize the letters of salt. S for steadfast. By the Oxford Dictionary, it means not changing attitude and aim. Steadfast also means faithful, loyal, true, constant, devoted, dedicated, dependable, so when our grandmothers described persons in the community as salt of the earth people, this was what was meant. Persons who by their expression of life behave in a loyal, true, dependable, devoted, and stable manner. But the opposite to steadfast is lack of fidelity, which in the Old Testament of the Judeo-Christian Bible in Genesis 19, 1 to 29, it has the story of Lot's wife, who was warned with other members of her family to leave Sodom. And she, in casting a fleeting glance backward, became a pillar of salt. Metaphysically, her lack of faith, her uncertainty in her move forward to let go of the opposite to her good, Sodom, so, if we are like Lot's wife and are content after the perceived shakeup in our life and affairs not to release the past that makes us uncomfortable in order to embrace a new mental pattern that supports our good, then we have condemned ourselves to reliving those experiences again and again, just like a pillar of salt. So when we pay no attention to the triggers, forgetting to return to first cause to dissolve those hardened conditions, then we must live with the effects. Some prefer to long for, cling to, the happier times in the past, rather than trust the present within, to lead us into a new dimension of greater good. There are others, are others who have a preference also, and sometimes, sometimes when presented, presented with the opportunity to, to write, write imagined, imagined wrongs and hurts that others aim at us, we ignore those cues towards forgiveness. The only time we have friends is the present, where we can change the discomfort by embracing a new mental pattern for a better experience, better tomorrow. Now is the time and the place to do the work of improving our consciousness. So let us be steadfast, unyielding, until we establish a new mental stance to experience a greater vision of ourselves. Reverend John Scott, our pastor, spoke last Sunday and gave us work to do on our consciousness by coming to understand and come to terms with and I quote, made in the image and likeness of God. I hope it was given serious consideration. John Harefield, in his metaphysical interpretation of the Bible stated, and I quote, perhaps God really did make us in its image, its likeness. In the continuing process of our evolution, it seems that this divine declaration of intent is still being unfolded. As finite beings, we have yet to absorb the staggering impact of infinity as an experience and not just an item of intellect. Each of us has the possibility to discern the power of infinity and the power of self, that big S, in conjunction with God. And it will and can create all things. The definite answer is in the union, end of quote. So we must remain steadfast in the pursuit of experiencing our purpose to unfold into our divinity. Our spiritual practices must add the necessary flavor 
to allow us to save our life more abundant, our oneness with the infinite life of God. Consistent practice does this. When we break our, pro or sorry, our practice, we know how uncomfortable we feel. Our experience becomes flat with fear, doubt, and uncertainty. Carefield continues. He says, we all have the opportunity to enjoy this ultimate encountering in this realm of a truly divine living thought form with conscious influence on the outer environment, end of quote. We live by principle and not by precedent. Our steadfast seeking to live from the kingdom within must always be foremost in our conscious awareness. Dr. Holmes, our founder of our teaching Science of Mind and the Spirit, reminds us in a passage of the Science of Mind magazine taken from June 1997. He says, hold thoughts steadfast in the realization that God withholds nothing from you. Therefore, prepare yourself for a life of joy, love, happiness, and well-being. Believe in the divine freedom, which is yours by birthright. So together, let us affirm this, and I read it once. I remain steadfast to the vision of my life. Filled with joy, love, happiness, and well-being. That is our birthright, friends. And we are to look forward to it because it is ours by our divine origin. So being steadfast changes thought, and therefore our attitudes must improve with the flavor of our godness. That takes me to A of salt. Our science of mind textbook in its glossary notes that in the meaning of mental attitude, an attitude means a position assumed or studied as indicating action, feeling, or mood. Our mental attitude then is the general tendency of our mind, the tendency our thought takes on a whole end of quote. Now, the thing with attitude is, when we have embodied a particular way of being, it announces who we are before we even open our mouth. So, it's just like salt. Once salt is in a dish, and you have too much in there, it speaks for itself. It is difficult to erase it except by masking it with other flavors. Mm. It permeates everything, don't? Same so with attitude. Our praise song has the phrase, attitudes are contagious like the measles or the flu. What kind of attitude will someone catch from you? Hmm. So if we are fearful, doubt, filled, or very carriage, how we comport ourselves really, it's like a red flag. So in a crowd, it just takes one, that pinch of fear, to set the confusion bonfire. You know that, don't? Just take one, that little pinch of fear, and confusion spread. So if we are steadfast in living a life of principle, consistent mental practice permeated with love, compassion, peace, power, beauty, and joy. Then our attitude, the general tendency of our thought, feelings, actions, beliefs, habits, behavior, every part of us must mirror that which is full of love, peace, harmony, beauty, and joy. To develop this mature attitude, to fully experience life at the highest idea of spirit's unfoldment through us, then the word surrender must come into place. Not something passive, you know, but an active transparency to allow the presence of God to be reflected in every single domain of life's expression. Our relationships, our career, 
our physical bodies, our engagement with life must reflect the goodness and loving kindness indicative of someone who practices the presence of God. By loving the Father, Mother, God presence within us, with our hearts, minds, and souls, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. In our surrender, we stop outlining how our life abundant must come about, but rather remembering, of myself, I do nothing, but the Father within doeth the work, of quote. We surrender our dependency on external means and completely abandon ourselves to the omniscience that guides us unerringly, even when we do not listen, or um, that omnipresence that is with us everywhere equally present, protect, protecting us. The omnipotence of God, there is only one power, one presence in the universe that sustains, maintains, and supports as the law of our own being. And the omni-activity of God at the center and circumference of our experience. Because what? God is the only activity. I am the Lord thy God. I change not. Of course. And with that attitude of surrender, there's the spice now of gratitude. A subtle outpouring of the soul in jubilation and fulfillment God expresses by means of us. We are the teaching of science of mind and spirit. Once we embody it, our lives are like the textbooks and the seasoning for all who come into contact with us. So yes, that is our position, our posture, our attitude of consciousness that goes before us each day, ensuring our way is made perfect, safe, secure, and filled with the joy of wholeness. Dr. Holmes reminds us in one of his talks on spiritual awareness, and I quote, since each of us represents an individualization of the nature of God, there is freedom of circulation of the divine love, reason, peace, joy, and perfection through the human. But we must cooperate with the wholeness of life if we wish to be made whole. Therefore, we should maintain a calm, expectant attitude, endeavoring to realize that we are some part of infinite life, end of quote. So as we remain in this calm, expectant attitude, we endeavor always to realize that we are some part of infinite life, circulating divine love, which leads me to the third letter, L for love. Give a little love away, give a little love away. A whole lot of love will come back to you. Just a little, much like a pinch of salt. Just give a little love to life and it is returned to us full measure, pressed down and running over. John 4, 1 John 4, verses 11 to 13 from the Judah Christian Bible. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit, end of quote. So what does that mean metaphysically? The connection of loving each other as how we are loved by our creator, who we cannot see, must come through the love that we share with our brother. We are individualizations of God and his spirit dwells in us, so love is an integral part of our existence. We were made in the image and likeness of love. Marianne Williamson states, only love is real, nothing else exists. If a person behaves unlovingly, then that means that regardless of their negativity, anger, or whatever, their behavior was derived from fear and does not actually exist. She goes on to say, 
when people behave unlovingly, they have forgotten who they are. They have fallen asleep to the Christ within them, end of quote. Forgotten who they are. Strong words. Let us remind ourselves who we are. Dr. Holmes teaches, and I quote, just accept then that no matter what your experience may have been until now, the truth about you is that while you were born of human parentage, the real you that came through the human parentage is an original, creative, wonderful being. You are God's beloved child. This isn't a myth. This is real. Accept this truth about yourself. End of quote. So if I am divine, then everybody else is divine. Be children of God. Family, co-workers, all those within our world of affairs are deserving of our respect, love, and goodwill. So we can divorce the people from the acting of, and remember who they are if they have forgotten so let us love a pinch at a time. Let us be the seasoning of love as we seek to practice through our consciousness of love. Believe it or not, it is present in our spiritual community. We all wish to experience a greater vision of ourselves and by extension, all members of our community. From this, this complete masterpiece, piece by piece, have come through all six innovative teams in a masterful strategic concept for our growth and expansion, resting on the legacy of our beloved founders. So yes, love has allowed this vision to emerge through us as us. And in fact, it is us. So we can own it is ours. Love is an experience, friends, just as how we experience God, as we partake of our divine nature, so we must love God, and we are loved in return. Love is, is a transcendent experience. So that takes me to the tea of salt. When we add the pinch of salt and flavor to the food, it bursts in the palate. We savor, mm -mm, somebody's stew peas that is in this temple now, savoring this divine taste. I mean, eyes open, faces aglow. Don't you know what I'm talking about, especially when the food is cooked with love? Am I right? Right. That transcendent feeling is what I'm talking about. We are able to animate and lift our consciousness from the plane of conditions to that of the absolute, where there is only wholeness. Life, love, light, peace, beauty, and joy. So if we are steadfast in practice, our attitudes place us in the altitude of faith and love. So when we affirm, pray, or treat, we know transcendence must take place. Let us go back to principle. We believe in the control of conditions through the power of this mind. We believe that the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind which is the law of God, and that we are surrounded by the creative mind which receives the direct impress of our thought and acts upon it. And of course, our thought and prayer is impressed in the mind of God, which is, which is our mind, mind, mind we, we are conscious, conscious of it. The mind of God, God, God is the law. law. How God, God works, works in the immediately acts to dissolve, to dissolve conditions. conditions. And that is the transcendent quality of our affirmative prayers. Dr. Holmes continues in his teaching, in his philosophy. He says, transcendency does not reconcile. It transmutes. I'll tell you what that means. When water reached boiling point, what happened? Steam. It's steam, you know. It's not liquid water. Is steam. When you freeze water to a point, what you get? Ice. So it doesn't borrow from the ice or borrow from the hot water. 
it is steam. Yes, it's still water, but it is different aspects of water, right? So it transmutes, right? That is what he's trying to say. So if we practice, practice steadfastly, we open ourselves to an ever-widening scope and greater possibilities. So this is what we mean when we refine our conscious awareness through spiritual practices, especially meditation. The unbounded is not filled with infinite possibilities, experiences itself through our point of recognition. Fertile minds must bring forth abundant harvest. Holmes asks, Dr. Holmes says, what would happen to any person where the divine spark is completely loosed in action? Would it carry with it not only the essence and presence, but the power back of everything? End of quote. This is what happens when we choose to experience transcendence as our natural state of being. We are taught in this teaching that we are working in a transcendent field. We are working in a field of that which makes things out of itself by itself becoming what it makes by a process of instinctive and inherent and inherent in the constitution and nature of its own being. It doesn't borrow from anywhere, end of quote. We are working in a transcendent field. We're working in a field that which makes its things out of itself by becoming what it makes. It is instinctive. It is inherent in the constitution and nature of its own being. It doesn't borrow from anywhere. That is why we are like who we are. We are, not self, we are self-existent. We do not have to borrow anything from anyone's consciousness. We go within to the kingdom of God and call forth our demonstration. We can create for ourselves and our world something that works for everyone. So in summary, salt is of value. It preserves, it protects, it is an antiseptic. Let us remain steadfast in the pursuit of experiencing and expressing our divinity. The appreciation of that divinity is our value as part of the universe, as part of infinite life. We add flavor through our individual capacities and abilities, and we assist each other to savor their own divinity through their spiritual magnificence. We are transcendent individuals, secure and protected with the infinite ability to create a better vision of self by loving God, ourselves, and others. So pinch by pinch, let us do this. So the homework that you got last week, if you didn't do it, please go back to it. What it means to be created in the image and likeness of our creator, hereby deepening our experience of our infinity. That is our transcendent quality. Nothing must stop us from involving into who and what we are. You hear? We are spiritual. We are creative. We are wonderful, beloved children of God. So we can affirm together, God has placed no limitation upon me. I accept my freedom to prosper. Again, can we say that together? I think it's on the screen as well. God has placed no limitation upon me. I accept my freedom to prosper. So it is. Ye are the salt of the earth. Namaste. Namaste.